All right, thanks so much everybody for joining us today on the September 1st Dr. Cog board work session. Uh, I'm Ashley Stolzman, Dr. Cog chair and Kevin Flynn, the normal work session chair uh, is out. So I'm chairing today and I'll call the meeting to order. Uh, that takes us to our public comment period for our work session. If there are any public comments um, or that people would like to make, now is the time. And I would just request that there are not public comments for which a prior public hearing has been held uh, before the board of directors. And so with that, I'll turn over to members of the public. And first, we'll hear from Brent Goodlett. And Brent, if you'll just please tell us your name and your address, and then tell us what you'd like to tell us. You have about three minutes. Hi there. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Brent Goodlett. I live in Centennial, uh, 18457 East Crest Ridge Drive. Um, dear board members, my name is Dr. Brent Goodlett, and I'm a climate and environmental justice advocate for the people of Colorado. And my comments today pertain to the draft rules for the GHG transportation planning rulemaking. Specifically, the regional GHG transportation planning reduction levels spelled out in table one of the draft rules stipulating that GHD reduction levels in MMT or million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent for each regional area and MPO and the total GHG reduction levels for the state. These reduction levels are simply not aggressive enough to ensure timely decarbonization of the transportation sector in line with HB 1261 nor are they commensurate with limiting warming to 1.5 degrees C below pre-industrial levels as recommended by the IPCC. By my arithmetic, GHG reduction levels in the draft rules don't add up to the often cited 12.7 MMT reduction from transportation by 2030 figure as stipulated in the state's quite optimistic GHG reduction roadmap and by CDOT Division Director Rebecca White per the August 4th Dr. Cog board work session notes. Instead, table one of the draft rules has a statewide 2030 baseline projection of 21.8 MMT, which is 8.3 MMT reduction below the 2005 baseline given in the roadmap. Add to that 1.5 MMT reduction level for 2030 listed in table one gets us to 9.83 million metric tons reduction, plus 1.8 MMT from the projected number of light duty electric vehicles calculated as the difference between table one and table two projections for 2030 gives a total statewide reduction of 11.67 MMT, which is over one MMT short of the 12.7 MMT target in the roadmap. Where could 1 million metric tons of additional transportation sector emissions reductions come from? One MMT of CO2 is equivalent to 112.5 million gallons of gasoline burned or the carbon sequestered by some 16.5 million tree seedlings grown for 10 years. Far from chump change, if you ask me. Indeed, the people that Dr. Cog represents deserve a clear and consistent plan for emissions reductions from the transportation sector, not accounting tricks. And while seeking clarity about table one targets of the draft rules, might I suggest that someone ask, what about transportation equity and environmental justice? As the words equity and justice do not appear anywhere in the draft rules. I could go on, but my time is about up. So I'll conclude by restating the reductions levels in table one of the draft rules, however they add up, are not aggressive enough to ensure that decarbonization of the transportation sector meets the targets of HB 1261, nor are they sufficient in the face of the growing climate crisis. We can and we must do better. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Goodlett. Any other members of the public care to comment on, uh, for us this evening? Next, we have Martha Rakowski. Hi. Um... And thank you, Dr. Cog. Um, I, I want to talk about the this uh, CDOT rulemaking as well. And you know, I come to you as you all are well aware on another really horrible air quality day in Colorado, with wildfires, horrible fires in California, and our own pollution that we're creating here. So, you know, uh, we have to reduce pollution from transportation. We know that there's two ways to do it. One is more electric vehicles, and we're on a good path on that. 
The other is that we need to make it possible for people to drive less. There's increasing consensus from the experts that we need to do both, that that's our pathway. So this rulemaking from CDOT is really a prime opportunity to prioritize transportation projects that will let people drive less, make it an option, not force them to do it, but provide the system so they can drive less. So I ask Dr. Cog to support this rule, but also ask CDOT to strengthen the rule, make it clearer with VMT targets, um, reductions in driving rather than this sort of mush together of electrification and VMT targets. Um, make sure that we're iterating on the modeling so that we can see how we model and then see what the actual real world results are. Um, embrace equity in both the process and the outcomes. And I would also encourage Dr. Cog, you all to think about um, being proactive on this and tell CDOT what you want to build with the funding that's available. This rule applies both to Dr. Cog, but also to CDOT. And I know that the Dr. Cog tip is regularly oversubscribed, especially in requests from all of you for bike, ped and transit projects. This could be an opportunity to help move more state money into projects that your communities want to build, like BRT, like better bike lanes, safer routes to school, um, push on the, the land use changes that we need. So, um, that, those are my comments. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of NRDC. Um, we are, we're part of a big coalition of environmental groups that are diving deep into this rulemaking. And I just wanna thank you for your work on this. Thank you very much. Any other members of the public care to comment today? All right, seeing none, that takes us to our agenda, uh, to our summary of our August 4th board work session. Sorry about that, it's in attachment A. Uh, if there are no comments on the summary, then we'll accept it. Seeing none, we'll move to our next agenda item, which is just a continued discussion on the greenhouse gas transportation planning rulemaking. Oh, and actually just before I get that to that point, um, just in the summary of the work session, I just wanna make a comment um, to folks and I'll, re I'll remind everybody at the end, but it's the time of year where um, you've been sent uh, a survey uh, the collaboration assessment. And so uh, if people would please go into their emails and complete that as quickly as possible. Um, it keeps it from having staff members or, or executive committee members from having to go through and call each of you individually. So if everybody could take some time this evening um, and fill that out, that would really help out a lot. Thank you so much. And so that will take us to our greenhouse gas transportation planning rulemaking discussion. And I'm gonna turn it over to um, Ron Papstorf, our director of planning and operations, it's attachment B. And just before I do that, I want to just encourage everybody that, you know, we're going to have an active discussion. Our work sessions are really inclusive and both the member and alternate can participate. And I just want to encourage everybody to use really active listening and try to understand what people are saying instead of assuming we know where, where the other ones are coming from. So with that, I'll turn it over to Director Papstorf. You're on mute. Ron. <laughs> hey, Ron, you're on mute. Gosh, trying, trying to multitask. I apologize. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good evening, members of the board and alternates. Um, now that I am unmuted, I am also trying to pull up the presentation for this evening. And you should be able to see that now. It looks great. Thanks, Ron. Thank you very much. Um, really appreciate everyone's um, uh, time and attention this evening. It's obviously a really important topic. I'll, before I kind of launch into things, I do also want to just acknowledge all of the hard work of a lot of the staff at Dr. Cog who have been engaged in this process for months, have been spending a lot of time um, uh, providing um, feedback and interacting with, with CDOT staff and other stakeholders in this process, and, and most recently reviewing the proposed rule. And, and so there's a lot of work behind tonight's presentation and discussion from a lot of folks, um, including Doug Rex, um, Steve Cook, Robert Spots, and Jacob Rieger from the Transportation Planning and Operations staff at Dr. Cog, and then Brad Calvert and Andy Taylor in particular from Regional Planning um, Division uh, uh, at Dr. Cog as well. So a lot of us have been working on this. Um, I happen to be the face of this, but I, I want everyone to know that there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of work behind this as well. So 
goals for this evening. Um, I'm going to provide a little bit of, of review, additional uh, context for the rulemaking. Uh, we had a lot of questions at the last meeting uh, with the board on August 18th around modeling. So Steve Cook's going to talk a little bit about sort of modeling and how that relates to, to the rule. Um, we're um, kind of my goal is to further sort of some of the questions that we discussed and presented at the last meeting and some some staff perspectives um, kind of in the in the uh, in the vein of sort of options to, for the board to consider and discuss and then again continued board discussion and initial direction to us again this is not this is not a meeting for taking any action by the board no voting on anything no formal direction sort of want want feedback from the board about whether this is heading in the right direction if you have additional questions additional things we ought to consider um, as we sort of continue our conversations after this meeting to try to get to um, dr cog comments on the proposed rule so with that um, just a reminder of where we are in the schedule if you'll remember back on july 15th the transportation commission authorized cdot staff to embark on the rulemaking process on August 13th, the notice of the formal notice of rulemaking was issued by CDOT. That kicked off a 60 day written comment period. Sorry, I, I neglected to update the slide. That ends on October 15th, not October 12th. Um, there will be a series of rulemaking hearings. I'll talk about those towards the end of the discussion this evening. Uh, but from kind of the middle of, of this month now, gosh, it's September already, uh, through, uh, through, um, uh, into October, um, a series of, of public hearings to solicit um, input um, and then formal comments through that written comment period. And at least now, at least now, the schedule calls for a Transportation Commission consideration of the proposed rule for adoption at the November 18th meeting. So a little bit of context for the rule. We talked about a little bit of this, uh, some of this at the last meeting, but just a reminder to, to the board members that, um, you know, some of the context includes the fact that Dr. Cog's Metro Vision Plan and Regional Transportation Plan um, also support um, the region's uh, desire to meet or exceed applicable federal, state, and local requirements and regional targets for air quality, including reducing greenhouse gas emissions related to surface transportation. Um, House Bill 191261 from the 2019 state legislative session um, uh, was passed and signed by the governor, uh, calling for reductions in greenhouse gas pollution and establishing statewide greenhouse gas reduction goals for all sectors, including the transportation sector. Um, House Bill 1261 then led to the uh, Greenhouse Gas Pollution Reduction Roadmap uh, that came out in January of this year that establishes pathways, ways to try to meet those, those climate targets set out in uh, House Bill 1261. And then most recently this year, um, Senate Bill 21-260, the state's um, transportation funding bill, uh, fee and funding bill, also established new requirements for CDOT to establish guidelines and procedures for the department and MPOs related to transportation planning um, and projects related to achieving uh, greenhouse gas reduction targets. So those are established law. CDOT's in the rulemaking process. Um, we, we know that there's lots of different opinions, um, both on the board and in the, in, in the public sphere about climate and greenhouse gas emissions and um, and what's what's happened leading up to this point, but we are in a rulemaking process, and I think this is our opportunity to sort of really think about the rule and see if there are comments that Dr. Cog uh, and the board wish to make directly to CDOT and the Transportation Commission on the rule. So our discussion, my discussion tonight, is going to focus on sort of the rule, the rule components, and how we and how we might provide comment on the rule. A um, couple of additional context pieces uh, for clarification. So as a reminder, the definite, one of the definitions in the proposed rule relates to applicable planning documents. Those are the, those are the planning uh, documents that are subject to the rule. So in the, in the proposal, our regional transportation plan adoptions and amendments would be subject to, are subject to the rule. Uh, the CDOT 10 year plan adoption and amendments and CDOT's four year prioritized plan adoption and amendments 
would be subject to the rule as proposed. TIP adoptions, uh, the Transportation Improvement Program adoptions by Dr. Cog and the North Front Range MPO, only those two MPOs would be subject to the provisions of the rule. Um, we have, we, I think at the last meeting, we had a little bit of confusion because the conversation before the rule conversation was about the Transportation Improvement Program policy for the next TIP cycle, where we talk about sort of regional projects and what's eligible for regional share of the TIP. And I wanna, I wanna clarify in the context of this rule and in the context of our federal air quality conformity for Dr. Cog, the definition of a regionally significant project as it relates to this rule and our federal air quality conformity um, include new regional roadway segments, new roadway widening of one or more travel lanes, um, or a, a new or converted managed lane of a mile or longer. So think of the regional roadway system as sort of the principal arterials, the freeway system, expressways, major arterials um, around the region not local city streets, uh, usually not sort of minor collector streets in the, in the local street system, but the, the larger principal arterial system. And then on the transit side, there are also recently significant transit projects that include uh, dedicated rapid transit lanes, rail, lane, rail lines or rail line extensions or new rail rapid transit stations um, on, the, on the fixed guideway transit system. So those are also considered reasonably significant. And again, just a reminder, that's not exact, that's not the same as sort of regional when we think about regional projects in the context of making decisions in the transportation improvement program. Um, one last piece of sort of additional context, I just wanted to remind the board about sort of Dr. Cog's role as a metropolitan planning organization. Um, that's a a uh, specific designation under, under federal law and um, with our local government members and the governor um, that brings specific responsibilities and authorities under federal law and regulations um, to really uh, provide the setting for effective and inclusive decision making um, among all of the interested parties, primarily the MPO representing local government members um, and the State Department of Transportation and any transit agencies that operate within the region. Um, the MPO is responsible for identifying and evaluating alternatives to help meet the region's transportation needs in a safe and efficient way um, over time um, to really meet the mobility needs of the region while also not creating adverse impacts to the environment. MPOs prepare and adopt a long-range transportation plan uh, that's our that's our regional transportation plan. It has to cover at least 20 years. You'll recall that when we adopted the most recent RTP, that's a 2050 RTP. So it actually has a 30 year horizon. But at a minimum, we have to we have to adopt a plan that covers 20 years, and we have to update that every four years um, at, at Dr. Cop. Federal um, law and regulations also set out specific planning factors that our planning pro our transportation planning process has to consider in that process, including economic development, including environmental impacts, including tourism and, and travel needs, including um, connectivity of the system um, and mobility for people and freight and safety among, among others. Um, we also prepare and adopt a transportation improvement program that covers at least four years. And um, what's really important in our planning process is, again, it's inclusive. It includes public engagement and public involvement and the involvement of our many, many stakeholders in the planning process. So with that context, um, I wanted to hand it off to Steve Cook. He's our manager of mobility analytics and operations in the transportation planning and operations division uh, to talk a little bit about modeling. And then we'll take a little break and, and have um, an opportunity for um, questions if the board has before we move into the meat of the rule. Steve. All right. Thanks, Ron. You, uh, we've been mentioning models uh, for, you know, several months now in the context of greenhouse gas analysis and other things that the, uh, the, board, the board has been dealing with. But we thought it would be good just to take uh, maybe three or five minutes to talk about our models. Uh, of course, if you wish to talk to talk with us for 30 minutes or three hours, we would be happy to, but probably not uh, at this meeting, maybe at, at, a, at a separate meeting. When we talk about models, you know, we're referring to 
computerized software packages, not written by me, I'm not at all a software engineer, but these are computerized packages that take thousands of pieces of information and then they do millions of calculations within the model when we press the button to try to predict certain outcomes, certain specific things, uh, results, performance measures, whatever, that are predicted for the future. Um, Dr. Cog is required by federal rules to have a regional travel demand model, which is what they're called. And ours in particular is called the focus model. Um, it's used and the, the FHWA, FTA require these models to be used for estimating changes in roadway traffic volumes, transit ridership, uh, total trips by travel mode, and all kinds of other results. And these the travel demand models have, have been around for you know, 40, 40 years, and I've been working with them for almost 40 years. Um, first off, for uh, our regional area, one key thing that we put on the slide here right away is we are modeling an area that's huge. It's a mature, complex transportation system in metropolitan area. You know, we've got 16,000 miles of streets, regional roadways, highways crisscrossing the region. Um, there's 18,000 miles of sidewalk. 2,500 miles of multi-use paths and bike and bikeways, uh, light rail, commuter bus. We're, we're driving 10 million vehicle trips a day. We're doing 15 million person trips a day, 2 million bicycle, pedestrian, scooter trips. There's just a lot going on in this huge mature system. And that's what we try to uh, replicate uh, with, our, with our model. Um, the first thing we try to do with the model is to replicate real world conditions. So these are looking at the data that we get from local governments, from your staff, related to transit ridership counts, related to traffic volumes on various roadways across the region. And so we try to create the model to replicate what's out there, you know, quote, today. Then after we have that, we can look at things in the future. You know, what if we change this or what if we change this? And especially for big picture changes, you know, that's what these models were originally required for is to look at really big changes like a brand new regional transportation plan looking 30 years into the future. So 30 years of economic and population growth, 30 years of projects, all of that. That's what they were designed to do uh, originally. Uh, they take many different inputs into the model. A lot of this, once again, we get from uh, local government staff, uh, things related to the transportation system, obviously. But then a lot of other things are built into these thousands of factors in the model. Travel costs, prices for different things, for gas, for insurance, for operating vehicles, transit fares, all of that. Probably the biggest component and most influential is just simply the population, the households, the jobs in our region, and especially for Colorado and the Denver region, the number of visitors uh, in our area. Also in the model is uh, commercial vehicles. Those are the ones that you, we don't think about a lot. We just think about we, you know, driving to and from work to school and stuff. There's a lot of commercial vehicle traffic out there, whether it's the lawn, lawn and garden person coming to your house to do the lawn, whether it's an 18 wheeler. Um, a lot of the outputs are listed here, the types of things we get from the regional model, travel trips by mode, uh, vehicle and person trips, VMT, which is vehicle miles traveled. So we'll hear that a lot. PMT, which is person miles traveled as well. Travel delays and average travel speeds are the types of things. Uh, next slide, Ron. Um, another key thing is that related to the greenhouse gas modeling, Dr. Cog does not do the actual air quality emissions modeling. We provide information from our travel model and we give it to the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. We'll just call it uh, Public Health Department right now or their air pollution control division. They run the actual emissions model and which is known as moves so they they do that we give them inputs so we give them 
uh, roadway segment information for, I think it's like 8,000 different uh, roadway segments uh, that we look at. Um, we give them the average congested travel speeds. So we don't look at the speed limit. You know, we don't necessarily want cars to go faster. Um, we're looking at having less delay. So those operating speeds are given to um, the health department. Then they take other information that they do inputs on, the types of vehicles out there, the classification of vehicles, big ones, small ones, uh, EVs, non-EVs. Uh, they look at the types of fuels used. And then they look at another important thing is what we note here in that fourth bullet there of, and what we call it is, is the, the operational behavior of the vehicles. Are they in motion moving? Are they idling? Are they stop and go stuck in traffic or are they parked? So all those things are important. And then the outputs from the health department model, the moves model is the actual emissions and what we forgot to put in here, I forgot to put in the outputs here, I just see right now is, is GHGs or the greenhouse gases. That is one of the um, important key outputs, uh, obviously, uh, for this process. Uh, and last slide or next slide, Ron. There's been a lot of questions too about what models, what our regional model outputs can be used for, how accurate are they, um, all those types of things. And actually on this slide here, I, I probably should have put them in reverse order. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with the one on the bottom, that fourth bullet down there. And as noted earlier, these regional travel models were initially created and required to analyze large scale systems. So looking at a regional transportation plan with all the transportation facilities and households and socioeconomic activity going on and you know, we have a yes there. We can produce really solid estimates for the region. You know, that's one thing that we have confidence in both the regional travel model and the air quality emissions model. Um, the second bullet from the bottom, uh, we label as a suite of major projects or a package of projects. We can do a really good job estimating emissions associated with a large group of projects. So the example there is the map on the right that just happens to have you know, probably a hundred different uh, roadway and transit projects, or maybe it's just roadway on that. Model can do a really good job of that, looking at, it's looking at a big picture of really high value uh, numbers. Uh, when we get to individual major projects, we have a maybe there, and you can probably do a pretty good, reasonable and accurate uh, job of getting information, especially for things like traffic volumes, average operating speed, it can do that. It gets a little trickier when you're getting into uh, other types of uh, measures, you know, such as greenhouse gases. It's also trickier when you're looking at smaller or lower volume facilities. You know, we can estimate a freeway that has 400,000 400, people a day on it at one point. Uh, such as I-25, uh, we can do a pretty good job of, you know, estimating things associated with that. But if it's a smaller street or a smaller roadway that only has 2,000 people or cars a day, or a transit route that only has 1,000 riders a day, it gets trickier and much more difficult in accuracy when you're trying to evaluate these smaller scale things. And then the item at the top there uh, for small projects, the model really can't reasonably estimate, you know, fuel and GHG changes associated with, with really small projects. If that wants to be done, you really have to get data on the use after the project to analyze it. And it's not a modeling process. Uh, this regional model has a really tough time. And same thing with the emissions model, when you put the two together, really, really tough time in terms of reasonableness and accuracy of looking at these uh, smaller projects and the, the fuel and GHG. And you know, one thing to point out again, that the basis for all of these GHG calculations is really the fuel that's burned you know, as part of the transportation system. That really is what it is. We're trying to get pe people and businesses to burn less fossil fuels. So with that, I'll... Uh, uh, let turn it back to Ron. Let's see if there's any questions. Yeah, thank you, Steve. And, and Madam Chair, if, if you're 
open to it, I think this might be a, a, a good maybe pause point just to see if they're just given the level of questions and comments on sort of the modeling at the last meeting, if there are if there are any questions from the board at this point before we launch into the rule. Great. Right. Any questions from folks on material that's presented at this point and just remembering that there's some facilitated discussion coming up later? Director Maurer? Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Steve and Ron. Um, in our last discussion, you you brought to light about how regionally, when we're you're doing the modeling, that works in a, in a in per year you know presentation. It looks like that's that works the best if you look at things regionally. So versus a smaller project, and that that you can get a better estimate of what's going on. But so does it work? Tell me, do we put like all the projects in in the very beginning and you put them in all the projects, right? For maybe those tip years or whatever. We don't put them in individually. We put them in as a group. And then, and then we say, okay, we're, we're meeting our goal. And if we're not meeting our goal, then do you just start pulling out a project and go, oh, that one's, that one's not, that one puts us over our limit. I mean, what's how are we going to go forward with using the models and trying to meet the greenhouse gas goals yeah thank you director Meyer. I'll, I'll start and then if steve has something to add i'll ask him to join but I, I think you're 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 right on your first point we we model a system of improvements and and primarily we model very directly sort of large regionally significant projects so those those big road widening projects, new roadway segments, new fixed route, um, fixed guideway transit facilities and system uh, uh, expansions and new facilities, new interchanges, sort of those big region, those regionally significant projects from an air quality standpoint that we talked that I talked about earlier in the context piece. We model those as a system. And you know, if by some chance our model result, the, the emissions model results came back and we weren't meeting the federal air quality budgets for, um, for ozone precursors or other, or other emissions, um, then we, we sort of rethink the plan and we, we restructure plan and sort of think about that. We don't do that project by project. We very much model, model as a system because that's sort of the best way to get at sort of what the, what the regional impact of a set of, of investments and improvements in the system are. I think that's good. Thank you, did that answer your question fully, Director Maurer? Well, I'm just wondering, how do you know when you're looking at that outcome from that model that you just ran, what to do next? Do you, do you have an idea of what well, then maybe we need to um, eliminate the length of a road widening project and maybe that'll bring down that output. I mean, I, I get I, maybe you don't know at this point. I guess I'm just curious how you go about that. Yeah. Uh, how you find Maurer. out what to how to change it to make it fit. Yeah, thank you, Director Maurer. I think it, it's an it's an interesting question. Um, when we were developing the 2050 regional transportation plan, one of the things we did sort of in the preparation to developing the plan was we, we developed and ran several different sorts of scenarios to test big ideas. And, and, and that work helped to give us good information about sort of mixes of project types and, and types of investments and focus areas that helped shape the regional transportation plan. And when we, when we did our modeling work and our emissions modeling, the plan met the federal air quality um, uh, target emissions targets that we needed to meet. So we didn't have to sort of cycle back and, and reevaluate the plan. Thank you, yeah, that was helpful. Thank you, Director Maurer. Director Odoricio? Uh, I, I think I, I think this might, so my question is, it, does this put small, those smaller projects at a disadvantage from being able to participate? Or does it just simply say that they're going to be harder to, to gauge? I mean, will there be some sort of penalty um, or will we have to start bundling projects so you can calculate those? I'm just trying to, what's the impact of what we're, of what, what you just talked about, I guess? Million dollar question, Director Odorisio. Let's see if Director or Mr. Pastor can take that on for us. 
Um, Director Rodericio, I really appreciate the question. I think that I, I, and I appreciate you sort of getting to perhaps the, the crux of this issue and sort of why the modeling piece is important. And, and I'll speak to it a little bit later in the presentation, but I'll give you a, a, maybe a little bit of a preview. I think the point of this is that there are limitations to how well the model can do certain things. We want the board to understand those limitations. The tool, the, the model is a really, really valuable tool and it will continue to be a very valuable tool as we, um, as we comply with whatever version of the rule ends up getting adopted by the Transportation Commission. That said, typically we very much just model sort of the really big sort of transit and roadway capacity projects directly in the model because that's what the model does best. There are other factors included in the model that help us estimate sort of the cumulative impact of other sorts of non-capacity projects. So our investments in the bike ped system. Um, and, but we don't, but we aren't, we haven't typically been very aggressive about sort of how we how we model those. Um, to answer your to answer your question specifically, I don't think it has any implications for putting any particular projects at a disadvantage. It's just a realization about sort of what the model can and can't do. And as I'll talk about a little bit late in a, a little bit later, sort of what we think is appropriate in terms of applying the rule to to certain things that we do. Director Rodericio, great, thank you very much. And next we have um, Director Mulvey. Yes, thank you. Um, I really appreciate the detail on the model and how it would be applied. It's very, very helpful. And so my question is to Mr. Cook specifically. The limitation that concerns me in the application of the model has to do with future planning because in my neck of the woods, and I know in some other outlying areas, we have new projects. And so we have a originally significant item that would this would apply to an interchange that would ap apply to, again, regionally significant, not just my municipality. And, um, but we don't have the measures that the model would permit application for. So I'm not being super articulate on this, um, but the question is how do we handle that? Because the model's excellent for what it can be used for and it's real specific, but what do we do and how can we use perhaps the parameters of the model to perhaps extrapolate what the impact of a project would be because that project would be planning for the anticipated traffic. There might be some traffic that you're gonna know about or some increased usage or VMT, et cetera, that you're gonna know about. But when you're doing the planning phase of a project and when you're asking a developer and et cetera and everybody else to contribute to a project of this magnitude, an interchange on an interstate, you necessarily have to plan ahead 10, 15 years in advance before the people are there and before the greenhouse gases are being admit and emitted. So, and before all the vehicles are there. So is it possible that the modeling can be used still so that we can not be boxed out on a very important regionally significant interstate project that's going to in affect transportation and commerce throughout the entire Denver metropolitan region on I-25, even though we don't have the metrics to apply this model. Yeah, thanks for the question, Director. And I wanna assure you, actually the examples you're giving that's exactly what the model is good at. Okay. We, we use the model and we also use it with consultants who are working on these transportation studies. You know, for example, on, on the new interchanges and the Crystal Valley and other ones on I-25. Actually, the model does a great job at looking at 
future traffic, future travel path changes, um, and future planning. That's actually what the model is designed to do. And we're probably working right now at this very moment on and assisting consultants on probably 10 or 15 different transportation studies, both roadway and transit all across the region right now. So actually your example is exactly what the model was designed for, was to analyze future impacts. One thing I always say is that the model results just for one given year are kind of meaningless. What we want to look at is the change over time of what if you do something. So if this is the condition today or the condition at a base point in 2030 or 2050, what will happen if we do X, put in an interchange? What will happen if we add a million people to the region? And we know that that has a big impact on traffic and transit. So actually, I, I want to assure you that your example is actually something that the model is very, very good at and is currently being used across the region. Okay, uh, Madam Chair, may I ask a follow up, please? Yes, thank you, Director Moby, please. Uh, That's super reassuring, Mr. Cook. So, um, the, so the model allows you to say, what if we do nothing? And then what if we do X? And what if we do Y then? I, that's good to know. So then if the model then is utilizing CDPHE numbers for air quality, so for example, the emissions uh, simulator, the MOVES, what does MOVES use or what's the output that you then would get if, you know, like there's, a, you don't have NOx, VOC particulates and CO2 to work with. Like, is, is that extrapolated? That's where it gets very, very difficult. What I was referencing a couple of minutes ago was the travel model results. So traffic okay. results, transit results, those are really good. When you start taking it to further levels, that's where it gets trickier and where this emissions model, this moves model was purely designed for regional scale. It was not designed for individual projects. So from an air quality mission standpoint, especially GHGs, that's where it gets very, very tough to do. Okay. And full, fully admit it, and anybody who works, I don't work with the MOVES model, but for folks that work with that, it's just, it's just trying to predict something. It's pretty easy, quote, easy, <laughs> to predict if you build a new facility, we think it'll have 40,000 cars a day. Or if we build this trans transit facility, we think it will have 10,000 riders a day. That's, you know, quote, easy. But to then say, well, what, how much more will people drive or how much more for the entire system will people drive? Because remember when a, when a, like a new roadway is widened or built, 95% of the traffic is coming from somewhere else. It's diverted. You know, people used to take Highway X and now uh, Highway Y has been widened or it's quicker. Traffic diverts to that. And that's the one thing the model does great at is looking at traffic diversion. It looks at transit ridership diversion. But as soon as you get into that fuel use and air, and air quality from a greenhouse gas, like is there more fuel burned when the new project is done? That's where it gets really tricky um, because the other item I, I noted in here on the slide that Ron just went to is that, that operational aspect that, of the vehicles. Are they moving continuously? Are they yeah. in stop and go condition? All those things just get really, really tough to get good greenhouse gas measures for individual projects, especially the small ones. A larger scale one, maybe you can get good good numbers, reliable numbers. So there's that difference between the travel model and then this the moves emissions model. I, I hope that kind of addressed your question, but it's very complicated. Well it does because you know an interchange is in a discrete area, even though it might impact something enormous. So an, an interchange on the, you know, the southern end of I-25 is going to impact commerce and et cetera. 
throughout the entire Denver metro region. And, and so, you know, how can you say that that one little location is just a little location when it's going to, you know, involve, you know, trucks, box trucks and, and other kinds of large transportation vehicles that are taking, you know, LTLs and FTLs, mm -hmm. full truckloads yeah. and lo light, little, lo less than full truckloads, if mm -hmm. to use the lingo of the industry, logistics, all the way up to like Windsor or whatever, the airport. So just as a process check, um, it's 446 and we have a, I'm, I'm not trying to cut off the, the questions about the model from folks, uh, but we have a lot of big topics that there's some facilitated discussion that'll help the staff prepare for the next meeting. So we have um, three hands in the queue on modeling, but if you can hold your question um, on modeling, put your hand down and otherwise we'll take the rest of them. And so next in the queue is Commissioner Levy, Director Levy, sorry about that. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair Stolzman. And I realize we do have a lot of material to go through. Um, but, you know, model, I think, as, as I understand this whole process, the, the limits of what modeling can do is going to be really important um, to how successful this, this proposed rule is. And um, sorry, my machine makes me put a password in or it's going to kick me out um, to how successful this is. So I just I just had a couple of questions that I think will help me understand what for when we get farther down the road. Um, when when your your slide on um, what what our model, the Dr. Cog model does. Uh, yeah, that one. Um, and, and inputs include decision making factors. Um, does, does that include, well, I have a couple of questions. I'll just, I won't, rather than dialogue, I'm just wondering whether that includes induced demand, mm -hmm. um, because as we start talking about, uh, how we consider capacity expansion and, um, whether we consider, it, whether we can model induced demand is really important and whether that's considered. So I, I did see Steve Cook not his head, but I think it'd be worth hearing a little bit more about how well the model actually can factor that in. And then, you know, as we look at the outputs and we see um, that it'll tell us a little bit more about delays and travel speeds. And, um, you know, there are, there are some trade-offs that have to be considered. So for, if you're lo looking at certain kinds of emissions, um, having, having less, fewer cars idling, um, and less delay, so cars are on the road for a less amount of time might be a good thing. Um, and so that might factor towards a project, but um, you know how, I guess knowing how these various things are assessed against one another is important. Um, so if overall it induces more travel, VMT goes up, but those, those vehicle miles are moving along more smoothly. You know how how does that show up in the in the emissions output? So um, I don't know if you need to answer these right now, but um, I think those are just going to be questions as we try to figure out what we can realistically do, and then answer some of the questions later about the tip. Um, and I also, I just I guess I really appreciated Director Odoricio's question here. Not that certain projects would be considered at a disadvantage, but I think it goes to, you know, what, at what level should we be applying the, the model? And we'll get to that later on. So, you know, can we, can we really model some of these individual projects that we're going to be scoring in the tip? If I could just give a 30 second quick response, um, since we have to move on, is the model does look at and does create induced demand. And for that one bullet there, the fourth, fourth sub bullet under the inputs, that's where the decision making factors come in. And that's a really simplified term for human behavioral decision making, demographics. So in our model, basically every individual of the three and a half million people living in the Denver region each person is modeled. Now we're not tracking each of you individually, but each person is modeled 
and each person has all these demographic traits of age, gender, income, auto availability, whether they're a student or not, whether they work or not, all of those things are then combined with other behavioral uh, functions deep within the model. I'm not an expert on all of those, all of those things. Um, and all of those things, then when we push the button and run the model, it does create inducement where inducement is most likely. And once again, it's, you kind of have to think of the real world of, you know, if a road out there out of this 16,000 mile system, if we add one mile of road or one lane mile, you know, how much brand new traffic will that create? It's pretty difficult and pretty small. It's a pretty tiny number. Will it divert traffic from other places? Absolutely, that's easy for the model. So I just wanted to assure you that inducement does is created by the model because of all these human decision-making factors. Thank you very much. And so if folks have additional questions on how the model works and things like that, please do send them in to staff and we can include mm -hmm. sort of a frequently asked questions in the board packet to kind of um, unravel some of those questions you might have. So we'll go on and Director Papsdorf, take us through the next piece. Thank you very much. Appreciate appreciate that. I know that took a long time, but I, it is it is a, it's kind of an important foundational piece. So I think it's time work, time well spent. I will try to get through this. I want to leave plenty of time for dialogue and discussion and questions by the board on the actual rule kind of following up from the last conversation. So I'm going to get into the proposed rule. So just very quick reminder, the rule has a number of components. It's amending an existing rule around uh, regional and statewide transportation planning. Um, it has a preamble. There are some new definitions. Uh, there's a slight change to the statewide transportation plan and then amendments to um, regional and statewide transportation plans that really affects the, the statewide transportation plan. I'm going to I'm not going to discuss those elements tonight. We talked about those last week and they're they're sort of the lesser part of the rule for tonight's discussion. So the new section eight in the rule is sort of the, the, the key component of the greenhouse gas emissions requirements um, in the transportation planning rule that's um, uh, been proposed by CDOT now. Um, it's got, it sets targets. It's a there's a process for determining compliance. There's a section on mitigation measures. There's a section on air pollution control division, confirmation and verification. There's an enforcement component and there's a reporting component. I'm gonna get through those uh, kind of following the same method we did at the last meeting on August 18th where we've expanded on some of the discussion and questions, uh, we'll have an opportunity for some, some discussion by the board. So again, this is table one out of the proposed rule. This sets baseline projections based on the state's application of the statewide travel demand model. So think of the model discussion we just had about the regional model, expand that out to cover the entire state. Um, much of the model is uh, incorporates all of the information from the five MPOs and then other information um, to, to develop these baseline projections for each of the years, 2025, 2030, 2040, and 2050. And then there are reduction levels that are in table one in the rule um, that the rule is meant to help achieve. So uh, one of the questions that we have flagged is sort of, will the baseline change over time? So acknowledging that the baselines were established uh, using a statewide model, there might be some differences uh, between the regional travel models that are more detailed in the regions uh, and more specific to the regions um, that, that aren't maybe um, captured adequately in the statewide model. And then there are things that change, changes to baseline projections. Uh, we, get new, we get new population employment forecasts from the state demographer's office. Um, there, are, there are things that can change that can affect those future baselines when we're, look, when we're looking out 20 and 30 years. So um, the discussion really was, you know, how, how do we sort of acknowledge or incorporate some adjustment to the baseline? So one option would might be to set baselines in a policy directive rather than in a rule, reference those baselines in the rule, but that basically allow a little bit more flexibility to refine those baselines based on metropolitan, on MPO modeling, on regional modeling, and more frequent updates um, as, as warranted with, as we get new information um, around population employment and other inputs um, to the work. So that's, that's that first one. I'm gonna go to, um, 
the next piece and I'll, and then I'll, and then I'll have a little bit of a pause. Um, are, so we had a question from board members at the last meeting about are the reduction levels reasonable or appropriate? And I think uh, as, as staff, we have a hard time uh, telling you definitively whether they're reasonable or reasonable or appropriate. But what we can describe to you is sort of that the reduction levels that are proposed in the rule, were developed based on a series of scenarios that CDOT modeled using the statewide model. And they, they had three scenarios that sort of stacked on top of each other. So I'll, I'll quickly describe those. The first was a travel choices scenario uh, that included uh, reduction in commuter trips. So kind of more teleworking, um, some reductions in sort of non-work trips, acknowledge uh, kind of anticipating that there might be fewer doctor visits because people can do tele telemedicine or remote learning at university. So there might be less school trips um, or, or some of those other non-work trips. Um, investment, further additional investments in sidewalk and bike improvements, and then reductions in arterial speeds to kind of reflect maybe changes like complete streets treatments or, or other treatments on arterial streets that might reduce uh, travel speeds and then a 50% reduction in transit fares uh, for transit operators around the state. So that was the first scenario. The second scenario took the travel choices and then added on to that additional transit um, strategies. So uh, including increasing transit service uh, for transit providers 6% per year from 2022 to 2030 and doubling service by 2050 and then bus fleet electrification. So, that, so that's the next scenario, the travel choices plus these additional transit um, uh, assumptions. And then the final scenario, the third scenario was the travel choices, adding in the transit, and then a land use um, component uh, to the scenario. So in addition to the travel choices and the transit, this scenario also then said that 75% of uh, growth uh, in uh, urban mixed use areas um, uh, and uh, retail and service job areas in Dr. Cog. So 75% of the growth would happen in these urban mixed use areas um, based on population density and uh, employment density, and then 50% in the other four MPOs around the state. So 50% of the growth in the other four MPOs would occur in those um, mixed use, in those mixed use areas. So that was the final. Um, the reduction, the proposed reduction levels uh, in, uh, in the rule roughly are based on the maximum reduction that was achieved from the travel choices plus transit plus land use scenario. So the most aggressive scenario with the most changes in the transportation system and land use changes, uh, the reductions that were achieved um, uh, led to roughly the, the reduction targets um, included in the proposed rule. And then I wanted to, this relates back to our modeling conversation. So the Dr. Cog model, sort of our base model, again, because it's not very good and because you can't really model a new sidewalk or a new bike path, we don't fully capture all of the impacts of all of the, of the, of the RTPs, sort of non-regionally significant projects. So those active transportation projects, operational operations improvements, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's really good at measuring the the regional impacts of the entire system of big capacity projects that are directly modeled um, in the model. Uh, um, but those, those other sort of non recently significant projects, the model, as we apply it today, doesn't fully capture those things. There are ways that we can, that we can estimate sort of the cumulative impacts of all of those together, those strategies together. And we did some of that work in our scenario planning around the model. Uh, development of the 2050 model, but we don't directly model discrete bike pad improvements and those types of things. I think that's a, a good pause point, um, Madam Chair. Great. So do folks have discussion points um, or questions that they'd like to put through to this point? Not seeing any hands right off the bat, but I'll just ask um, Mr. P or Director Papsdorf, um, do we have any sense of how RTD is going to weigh in on this? I, I mean, the rule doesn't necessarily directly apply to them, but if you look at this modeling, there's a significant assumption on what they'll plan to do in this time horizon. Yeah, I mean, and, and I, I should note, and I neglected to note, you know, 
this was a modeling exercise to sort of show how maybe you could reach those or what the what the at least from CS perspective they thought were the appropriate reduction levels to include in the rule. Nothing in the rule would require anybody to do any of those things if there were other ways to achieve the, the reductions. I just wanted to describe to you what, what, the, what the modeling assumptions were that CDOT made in order to establish those, those um, reduction levels in the rule. Um, to, directly to your question, uh, Chair Stolzman, is that uh, you know, clearly RTD is a very important um, transportation service provider in this region, and um, they are um, an important partner in our regional transportation planning process. Um, and you know, RTD will review the rule and weigh in as, as sort of RTD and the RTD board uh, deem uh, appropriate. Thank you, Director Levy. Yeah, thank you. And I, I don't want to be the director who always has her hand up, so <laughs> I'm not going to keep this right up. But um, this, um, the question of, I don't know whether these reductions are reasonable or appropriate, you know, they, they do assume best case scenario. Um, they're more, there's more than one way to skin a cat, though. And I think, I guess I just want to make a comment. I don't have a question. And this goes back to Martha Rostowski's comment. And I think it's other folks have made this observation that um, having some concrete VMT reduction targets could make this a lot less slippery. And, and it could address some of the concerns about the imprecision of the modeling, because as I understand things, which could be completely wrong, we, we may have a little more confidence in our ability to, to model and predict um, increases or decreases in VMT than, than we might in, in emissions themselves, because we don't know what, what's the fuel mix on the highway, on any particular highway or, or you know, particular segment and things like that. So I guess I'm, it would be a comment maybe to send back to CDOT here it is whether there ought to be some sort of a side-by-side, -side, you know, a, a VMT reduction target that lives in the background. Thank you, Director Levy. Director Maurer? Um, maybe you can tell me when, when I'm looking at the travel choices plus transit and it says 6% annual service increase, was, was there something that said there's a way that that's going to happen? I mean, are they going to serve Starbucks on the transit now to get people on there? I'm just curious how they got that 6% and they and there's maybe is that a comfort level with that six percent annually? Um, Director Maurer, thank you for the question. That's a that's a that's an increase in service. So that's an increase in the number of buses and how frequently buses run. Oh, run. it's okay. not an increase in ridership. Okay. The presumption right. is thank you. more service equals more ridership, but this is a this is on the supply side of, of transit. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Director Papstorf, if you could just uh, maybe you covered this, but um, are we anticipating seeing uh, just a preliminary cost of what this travel choices plus uh, transit plus land use would be if this was the way it was accomplished? Are we expecting to see that from CDOT? Um, uh, thank you, Chair Stoltzman. I don't know. I know as part of the rulemaking, um, CDOT does have to prepare a cost benefit analysis uh, for the rule. Uh, they have to issue that cost benefit analysis by September 4th, I believe is the date. So uh, this week, um, I, I don't know, I, I don't know what the, what the parameters are and what, or what's included in that, in that cost benefit analysis. Um, we have, I can tell you, we haven't, we haven't, Dr. Cog hasn't tried to sort of cost out for the region sort of what all of this would look like because we don't know exactly what all of the breakdown is um, on sort of the sidewalk and bike improvement investments in the Dr. Cog region versus statewide um, or you know what what it would take to achieve the arterial speed reductions through sort of retrofitting arterial facilities 
Um, I think 50% transit fare reduction in the RTD service area would be um, in the order of I, uh, estimating about $75 million a year of, of um, revenue um, to kind of cut RTD fares in half. I think that's about right. Um, we, haven't, we haven't priced out kind of all of the service increase um, costs of these scenarios. Thank you. All right, well, if you wanna to go to the next slide. Thank you, I'm gonna shift into the compliance piece. So again, just quick reminder, um, when adopting or amending a new RTP, uh, adopting an RTP or amending an existing RTP or 10-year plan, um, CDOT and the MP or, or the MPO as applicable would conduct a greenhouse gas emissions analysis. The analysis basically looks at the existing transportation network and implementation of, of the reasonably significant projects. So that's what the greenhouse gas analysis is based on. Um, the estimate is a total of um, carbon dioxide equivalent emissions for each year in the table one. We talked about that. There's a provision for agreement between the three main entities and the MPO, CDOT, and the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment on the modeling assumptions that are used for, the, for that modeling work for the analysis. Um, and, and the rule does not apply to amendments to an adopted four-year TIP. So uh, just a reminder of some of the questions and some discussion. So um, kind of how, how can TIPS, which are very near term, sort of be analyzed against greenhouse gas reduction levels in horizon years, right? So when, you're, when we're adopting our next TIP cycle that covers the years 24 through 27, very near term, how do we measure sort of the impact of, of those investments against 2040 or 2050 when we've already done that for the, for the 2050 RTP? And all of our tips have to be sort of uh, consistent with those. So, um, you know, it doesn't align with the rules horizon years. Um, assessing the tip against the nearest horizon years might be appropriate rather than all of the out years. Maybe that's a, an, an option to pursue. Um, and then the second question is, should the greenhouse gas reduction levels apply to tips at all? Is, is the uh, kind of at a regional scale and for the MPO's work, is, does it really matter about the plans that we adopt? Because TIPS by federal law and regulation um, have to be consistent with the plan anyway. So when we adopt a regional transportation plan, that becomes the basis for any transportation improvement program, that near-term investment. Um, any project in the TIP has to be consistent with the, our, with the regional transportation plan. Um, so, so long as the RTP has demonstrated compliance with the rule, is there additional value to sort of assessing the, the near-term investments in the TIP, remembering that our tools aren't very good at assessing individual projects. We look at sort of a system of improvements and those improvements are already included in a, 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 a plan, in a regional transportation plan. Thanks, Director Papstorff. And just a reminder to everybody, the staff's listening to the deliberation and discussion. We might not all agree on all these different points, but it'll help them to formulate what to, what to bring forward in the next meeting. So a good discussion here is really helpful. Director Brackett. Yeah, I think for, thanks for that, uh, Ron. I'd, I'll start with the second one. I, I do really see a value in uh, applying the GHG reduction levels to, um, to the TIPS. You know, the, the RTP, it's a 30 year document. And the reality is, is, is that most likely not every single project in the RTP will be completed over the life of the RTP, right? So, you know, different opportunities come forward, different projects get prioritized. And, and then, you know, it changes every few years as different priorities arise. So I think, um, you know, the, it's not like we're gonna implement the entire RTP just you know, in, in the exact phases that, that were previously determined, it changes over time. And, you know, one could imagine that if you, if you just said, well, the RTP as a whole is good, and then you know, so don't worry about the tips. And, and let's say that for some reason, the projects that we prioritized in the near term were only the ones that increased GHG emissions. And we only got to the ones that reduced the emissions like 25 years out. Well, then, you know, the maybe once we got to that 2050 horizon, we'd be hitting those targets, but in the meantime, we'd be missing the interim targets. So I think it's really important that we analyze how we're complying and moving towards the right targets at each step along the way in the TIP process. Understanding that the modeling on that is really difficult, but I mean, the, the modeling is gonna be challenged throughout this. And I think we need to take our, our best crack 
um, at this. And so I, I know the rule as as written includes the tips for us in Northern Front Range, and I, I think that's better than not would be my, my thought. So that's my input. Thank you. Thank you, Director Brockett. Director Seitz. Thank you. Um, first off, I want to apologize to everyone on this call. I did have um, miss a good chunk of the last bit of this presentation due to some technology challenges. Um, as a new director for Dr. Cog, um, I, I want to preface everything by saying I'm just consistently impressed with the uh, um, reports that we receive, the agendas that we receive, and also the presentations that really help me come up to speed. Um, somewhat quickly on this, um, but I'm going to ask for some um, patience with me as I ask a few questions. Um, I felt the first part of this presentation helping us understand the modeling very, very helpful, um, talking about focus and then um, move as the two different models that kind of feed each other and what their limitations are. And you may have already covered this previously while I was unable to hear. Um, but as one of the options before us, my, and, and please forgive me, I am new, but my understanding is we do reopen the regional transportation plan every four years ago. We just did that. Um, it's a 30 year document. What I'm hearing is that 30 year document, that RTP is then what is used to help inform the tip cycle and the scoring for the projects. Am I accurate? Yes. Okay. And so what we've had happen um, is now that we have, you know, both 1261 and 260, th the law is that we need to, in, in regards to our work, um, comply with those greenhouse gas reductions. And so um, I'm just going to expose my ignorance as one of the options to reopen that RTP process so that it, that is folded in. Um, I, I believe um, I heard you mention that kind of the move modeling that was done by CDPHC informed by your focus model um, met federal um, air quality requirements and standards, um, but clearly didn't contemplate um, hitting the 1261 and 260 um, requirements. And so I'm wondering, do does it make sense, and, and please forgive my ignorance, um, but does it make sense to reopen that portion of it to then inform the tip um, and I know that that represents a lot of work and energy and votes. So um, just believe in having safe places for people to ask all the questions. And I hope you'll honor the, the good intentions that that question is, is meant to have. Yeah, Director Seitz, it's a, it's a fantastic question because the, the, the process gets fairly complicated fairly quickly uh, when you layer on this rule. And remember that Senate Bill 260 and 1261 didn't set specific targets for transportation planning this rule will do that. So when we were developing the 2050 RTP, we didn't have anything to sort of gauge the plan against uh, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, other than sort of our Metro Vision goals of reducing greenhouse gas emissions per capita um, over time. Um, so, and that was certainly a lens that we looked, looked through as we developed the 2050 RTP. Senate Bill 260, and I'll, I'll speak to this a little bit later because the rule sort of mirrors that language, does require um, Dr. Cog and North Front Range MPO to sort of reevaluate their regional transportation plans um, against these new targets set in the rule once the rule is adopted. Um, and that has to be completed by October 1 of next year, 2022, October 1 of 2022. Um, so that's already, we, all, we know we have to do that and we will do that. And we're working on sort of laying out sort of a schedule and process for doing that. At the same time, um, we need to we need to develop our next four-year transportation improvement program um, covering years 24 through 27, so that we have a new four-year tip in place, and so that we have a plan for actually investing the new significant multimodal options fund money that's included in Senate Bill 260, for which Dr. Cock will receive a portion to allocate to to local priority projects under multimodal options fund. And a big chunk of those multimodal options fund monies have a deadline for getting them spent. And so we need to move quickly in that next tip cycle. And we can't really wait until after October 1 of next year to start that next tip cycle. We need to start that next tip cycle as soon as we possibly can, which is looking like it'll be January. And we've been having conversations with the board and with TAC about sort of developing the, new, the next policy to guide the development of that tip. So 
it does get very complicated. It's pretty messy. We're trying to we're trying to sort of maneuver through many different sorts of points and requirements and make sure that we're keeping everything on track. It's not going to be easy. I I really appreciate your patience and the grace of the rest of my directors helping me get uh, caught up here and, and and that I think I have a much better grasp on it now. Um, I tend to agree with um, Director Brockett that knowing that it's coming, I think we probably can't afford to lose a year of having some um, of GHG reductions um, applied to this this tip, this for your tip cycle then. So thank you. Thank you, Director Kerbeck. Yeah, uh, thank you everyone. It's This is very interesting. I wanna follow up on Director Mulvey's uh, scenario on uh, uh, in her interchange in, in the South Metro area. We all know that uh, Douglas County has has less uh, uh, residents, and and that will that interchange. Just a practical matter. We all know that it will uh, add uh, induced transit. Uh, it'll, it'll it'll have more cars because more people are going to live there, and they're going to use that uh, that intersection so they can get around. And we also know that the model is very very difficult in in evaluating uh, greenhouse gas uh, reductions or, or numbers. So, so my question is understanding since we have to prove, as I understand it, where, where there's induced transit demands that uh, there will be a reduction in greenhouse gases, how will we ever be able to build uh, an, intersect, an interchange ever again? It, it seems to me that all this is developing toward the confusion and the inability to show uh, reduction in, in uh, GHD uh, levels that the only way we could do this was to would be to uh, to not build roads, uh, not build anything that that would add uh, uh, induced demand. Or am I missing something? Help me out. How 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 would we able ever to get this thing approved? How would we ever ever be able to show uh, reduced greenhouse gas? Uh, reductions if we are going to expand the roadway transportation system. Director Papstorf. Yeah, uh, Director Kerber, thank you. I, I, you know, first of all, I, we don't we don't know if our current plan is going to meet the reduction targets. When we when we look at all of the investments that are included in the plan, and there there are roadway capacity improvements that are proposed and included in the plan by local jurisdictions as well as CDOT and RTD and everyone everywhere in between. Um, but there are also a whole bunch of investments in new transit service, in transit facilities, in bike ped facilities, and other changes that, that can happen. And when we model all of that together, we'll, we will see where we are. I think hopefully you all got a, a little bit of a sense from Steve's um, discussion around the models and how the, how the travel model and the emissions model sort of relate to each other. And as, as Director Levy pointed out, there are interesting sorts of interactions between um, travel and how travel occurs and different um, emissions of greenhouse gas emissions, of volatile organic compounds, of nitrous, nitrous, nitrogen oxides. All of those things have, there are different ramifications. If you have a really, really congested roadway where thousands of vehicles every single day are sitting in a lot of traffic and in experiencing a lot of delay. They're also burning a lot of fuel and emitting greenhouse gas greenhouse gases uh, by burning that fuel and just sitting in traffic and not getting to where they need to go. There are potential scenarios where if you alleviate that congestion and reduce the amount of idling and sitting in traffic congestion, that, that can have a positive impact on uh, by reducing emissions because less fuel will be burned uh, from less vehicles just sitting in traffic and sitting in experiencing congestion. That same project while reducing delay might also shift some vehicles from other parallel facilities. Some vehicles are make some people are making personal decisions. I know every day, if I go on that route, I'm going to be sitting in congestion for a significant amount of time. So instead of taking that route, I'm going to take this route over here instead. This route over here might be longer, a longer distance, but it might be the same time or it might be faster. It might be less stressful for the driver. So all of those things start to interact with each other. That's where the regional model is really good at sort of estimating those regional sort of travel changes and 
changes in how traffic occurs. And then the, the emissions model takes that those outputs as inputs and predicts emissions. And so it is a very complicated thing, but neither Steve nor I wanted to give the impression that we can't estimate those changes or those impacts on a regional scale. We can, and the regional impacts of those sets of investments together. I, I guess my question is, how will we ever be able to build uh, Director Mulvey's interchange? Because we can't model that the, the greenhouse gas is coming off of that interchange from what you told us. So it, it seems to me that like, we'll just be able to guess and say like, well, if we put 90% of our money into uh, uh, to, to uh, ped and uh, bicycle and transit, maybe we can convince CDOT that it's close enough and maybe we can get it built. That, that, that seems to be how we're gonna have to proceed practically. I understand about the complexity and, and Director Levy's perfectly correct. She's that it does make a difference whether you're sitting in traffic or whether you're moving fast. But with the bias and the rule toward uh, uh, being against induced transit uh, demand, uh, it seems to me as a practical level, when we're making these actual decisions, that this is very, very much biased against increased roadway uh, transit. And it's going to be very, very difficult based on our modeling to, uh, to be able to prove it. Uh, so as a result, being practical people and taking the path of least resistance, we're going to have to uh, uh, abandon a lot of those roadway projects. And, I, and I'm not sure that that's in the best interest of the, of the citizens uh, of, of, you know, of our region. So but thanks. Ryan. No, I know it's hard, <laughs> uh, but it just seems to be that's the way it's going to go. Uh, and, and we ought to recognize that. Thank you. Um, Madam, Madam Chair, I need to do a time check. It's 20 minutes after the hour. Um, I think the meeting's scheduled to be done at 5.30. I've got about 16 more slides to get through. Um, so I don't. I, I guess I, some guidance from, from you and the directors about sort of how you want to proceed. Yeah, so um, there is a lot of really good uh, question and answer, you know, question and options listed here. Um, I think, I would propose to the group, I think there was an option that you laid out, um, Director Papsdorf, that had tonight's meeting and then further discussion and question at the board uh, meeting and then not taking action on a position until the following meeting, making a special meeting for the work session in October. Um, and I just would take the temperature on the group on how we feel about that. I think we're having um, good discussion. I think people are coming up to speed. There's, there's just, this is happening so fast and we still don't have very fundamental questions answered about costs. Like does our existing tip meet this rule? We just don't have very fundamental uh, information that we need to be able to make a position. So I would suggest that we go until 5.30 today and then we can continue with the presentation that you have here at the work meeting uh, later in the month and then not take a position as a group until uh, the first meeting in October. Um, I guess I'll turn to the executive director and see how he feels about that and then ask you, Ron, too, uh, Ms. Director Papsdorf, just how you feel about that and then take the temperature of the group on that path forward. Executive Director Rex. Um, Chair, I think that's the appropriate strategy for sure. Because like, you know, we could, um, and I think at that time we'll have some additional information on the on the uh, economic impact as well that we could roll into the discussion. So I think running until five thirty is a great idea, and I see Ron is, is nodding his head too. And then we'll have a, a more comprehensive conversation at the business meeting in a couple of weeks. Um, and so. Director Papsdorf, are there questions today that would sort of help the staff? Because I, I recognize like we're all coming up to speed on a certain time frame, but we do have the limitation if we need to take a position, if we want to take a position before the rule is decided on. So are there any sort of um, North Star questions you, that staff really would like to hear direction from members on that would really help frame some of the discussion at the next meeting? Are there any of those points or do we really just need to work through all of these points? Um, thank you. Thank you, Chair Solzman. I'm going to, yeah, I, I think it help, It might help if we go, if we continue to go through in sequence and not sort of jump because it's it's tough to sort of pick out one thing. It, it, the rule is complicated. There, it all kind of fits together to, to Director Kerber's point which is really important because he was getting at some of the things that are addressed in sort of other parts of the rule. So um, it, it does all fit together. I might just review real quickly with the board sort of the remainder of the compliance piece, wrap that up, 
and then I can talk about sort of next steps and 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 wrap things up if that's okay. That'd be great. And then just can I see? I can only see so many people's faces because uh, not everyone has their camera on. But just from the people watching, just the path that was laid out, um, where we would talk about this until five thirty, and then continue discussion at the meeting, and then voting not until the October meeting. Does that work for folks in general? All right. I see a lot of head nods and thumbs up. So that'll be the plan, and that's what we'll do. Um, so that meeting in October, it would be the early meeting in October, it'll be a special meeting then because um, work sessions, we don't give direction and take votes. So please make a, a note on your calendar that where we normally have a work meeting, it would be a special meeting um, where we can take votes and, and make action. And so with that, I'll turn it back over to you, um, Director Papstorf. Thank you, Chair Solzman. So I just, I'll wrap up sort of the compliance piece real quick. Um, so again, um, after we've done that analysis, um, there is there's a process in the rule for CDOT to establish some, an administrative process for selecting measuring mitigation measures. We'll talk about mitigation measures at the next meeting um, more specifically. Um, the next piece is, again, referencing Senate Bill 260 language by October 1st of 2022, CDOT. Um, needs to update its 10-year plan and Dr. Cog and North Front Range have to update our regional transportation plans to demonstrate compliance with the, with the reduction levels um, after October 1st of 22 um, for each applicable planning document then again and that's our regional transportation plan and as proposed our, any, any new uh, transportation improvement program that we adopt uh, we have to meet sort of the corresponding greenhouse gas reduction levels. Um, and there's a there's a review process there uh, to provide to the Transportation Commission the greenhouse gas transportation report that sort of lays out um, our compliance with with the rule. And then finally, that um, that greenhouse gas transportation report that we uh, that we provide to the Transportation Commission when we're getting ready to adopt um, a, a new regional transportation plan or a new tip has to have that analysis demonstrating compliance with the reduction levels or getting to Director uh, Kerber's question or that, th that for us, for Dr. Cog, we're utilizing our available CMAC and surface transportation block grant funds on projects or approved greenhouse gas mitigation measures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And CDOT in relation to the 10-year plan outside the MPO areas um, is, is using available 10-year plan funds um, that would otherwise be used on regionally significant projects, those big capacity projects, um, um, in our MPO area on projects to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and, those, and, and a mitigation action plan that identifies all uh, any mitigation measures uh, needed to meet the uh, reduction levels. And then by April 1st of each year, we provide a status report. So every year we report to CDOT, to the commission, um, on um, a status report on any any of those mitigation measures. So I get so a couple of the questions that we had around this piece just to wrap up tonight's conversation um, is calling a you know, planned bike pedestrian complete street other non reasonably significant projects that are included in our regional transportation plan. Um, you know, do, by calling them mitigation measures, so does that subject them to annual reporting? And the answer is yes. So if they're called out by the MPO as a specific mitigation measure, then they get included in that greenhouse gas transportation report. And then we report on them every year on April, on April 1. And we had a conversation sort of last at the last meeting a little bit about, you know, should non-reasonably significant projects included in the RTP uh, be, be used to, de to demonstrate compliance with the reduction targets, and, and we think that they should. Uh, I think Director Levy at the last meeting spoke to the fact that we should we should look at the entire of the entirety of our planned investments, not just those regionally significant projects. Because as Director Kerber mentioned, we're doing lots of things in the plan and, and in a tip and in a four-year tip, we're doing lots of investments that besides just widening a roadway or building a new interchange, and and at that whole system has to work together. And so the discussion here, just to wrap up tonight's conversation, really was about, um, you know, is there an option where um, the analysis we want to call out in the rule that the analysis doesn't just include reasonably significant projects, but other non-reasonably significant transportation system improvements that are included in the plan so that we're getting a full picture of the impacts of the plan and all of the planned investments, either in the RTP 
and or the and the tip so that we're getting a full picture of how well we're doing and we don't call those mitigation measures when we build when we expand the bike ped system that's not a mitigation measure that's an improvement to the transportation system when we do a complete street retrofit on an arterial in the region that's not a mitigation measure that's a real that's a really important investment in the transportation system and we need to look at that as a system as a whole um, that will conclude sort of the discussion point um, uh, for the presentation. And then if you want to take a few questions, I can just wrap up with sort of next, just next steps. Well, so I, I think um, because it is 530, we should just start with questions on this uh, in the beginning of the next time. I just don't think we'll be able to do it justice today. And so if you want to summarize, Ron, where you think next steps will take us, that'd be great. And then I have just a few comments on that too. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. So just as, as you pointed out, um, we we have the next board meeting, September 15th, we plan, we, uh, we plan to bring back uh, for direction uh, to staff uh, or comments on the rule. Um, as we discussed, uh, given how much more there is to, to talk about an alternative is and, and her, her general consensus that we will have further our conversation at the next board meeting. And then at the October 6th board work session, we'll schedule that as a special board meeting and hope to get sort of finish all the discussion and get specific board direction on Dr. Cog comments on the rule at that meeting. That written comment period extends from August 13th to August to October 15th. So we, that does allow us time to get our written comments into the Transportation Commission within that window. And then just today we got notice that there were a couple of changes to the slight, slight adjustments to the schedule um, so that um, the the public hearings that were scheduled will start on September 17th instead of September 14th. They'll now extend to October 7th instead of the 4th. They've added an additional public hearing up in Weld County. The two public hearings that were previously scheduled on September 23rd at Swansea Recreation Center in Denver and on September 27th at the South Suburban Sports Complex in Littleton, those both remained the same. They're still on the schedule for those dates. So no change to the hearings in the Denver region, um, but a slight change to the overall schedule and um, an additional ninth um, public hearing. That is it. Thank you. And so with that, um, we'll have a good discussion at the work meeting, picking up where we left off. And please do feel free to, and I would encourage you to email questions you have in to the staff to um, Ron Papstorf so that he can contemplate them, include them in the packet material, like really get answers to the things that we're looking for. So please do send those questions in, uh, in, in the between time. And then normally um, we only put incredibly routine and customary things on the consent agenda um, for work meetings. And so I'm just gonna encourage staff to put things on the consent agenda uh, to the maximum extent practi practical. And I just want board directors to hear me suggesting that. And then if there's something on consent that's really problematic, a board director can just take it off consent and we can put it back on the regular agenda. But if we start with them on consent, um, then we can make sure we um, allocate the appropriate time to this conversation, which is really time sensitive and we need to get through. And so I'll turn it to Executive Director Rex, and then it looks like there are a couple questions. Executive Director Rex. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to acknowledge, and you, and you got to the point that um, we, we acknowledge that there are the questions and comments that are in chat, and we will we will pull those and um, and respond to those. And in, in the next in the next agenda um, packet, we'll include the question and answer portion. So just FYI. Thank you, Director Sites. Thanks. I just wanted to ask a quick question about the timeline. Since we're going to um, continue the conversation at our next um, full board meeting and then have a second board meeting on in October, will we miss the opportunity to participate in these rulemaking hearings? Um, Director, Director Papstorf, do you want to comment I, on that? I think I think individual board members representing your local jurisdictions, or you know, you should you should attend as many of those public hearings as you wish to it wish to attend. Um, and the public hearings, I think, will be a good opportunity, good learning opportunity to to listen to other folks' comments and and um, mm -hmm. hear some of the discussion. Um, so I, I don't think any anything on the schedule would. Um, prevent any board member to attend any of the public hearings that they wanted to uh, represent in their local jurisdictions. It's just that Dr. Cog's official comments on the rule 
really need to come through the board at a board meeting. So um, I guess that's my view on it. I don't know. Right. Don't and the there's a formal way for those to be um, considered by the Transportation Committee after that date. Dr. Cog has the ability post-October to, to do that directly. And we don't think as a group that it's important to have had those discussions formally prior so that individual board members representing their community are coming so with a, the full set of data and the full set of the conversation. That's, I'm, I'm just a little bit nervous about so the, um, the time. Sykes, I'm not sure if, if that I fully understand you. So the written comment period is to accept co public comment on the rule and it extends through October 15th. So we'll be able to have taken board action before the comment period ends. Correct, so uh, I'm, I'm tracking with that. So that is us as Dr. Cog, but because the um, two rulemaking hearings where individual um, electeds may go representing their community come possibly before the full conversation, do we have any, I guess, concern that we won't be helping inform as a body, helping inform fully um, those individual comments from our communities? Like, I, I guess, are we at all nervous about pausing on the conversation tonight and extending it out? And if not, that's fine. I, I again, am, yeah. are, are we, Director Seth, I totally appreciate, it's a, to I totally appreciate the, the question. I think it's somewhat philosophical because we can't impact the hearing schedule and and we don't have the information we need to have the next conversation. Like there, the cost analysis hasn't been done by CDOT. Like we don't have the information for the next conversation. So we really can't, CDPHE hasn't run the model for us. CDOT hasn't provided the data for us. Um, so we can't really move up our board meeting discussion. We could schedule a special meeting before October 6th, but I imagine calendaring it may be challenging Difficult. with 58 elected officials. So. Yeah, um, you're you're absolutely right, and that was my question: is was the October one? Did we want to push it earlier? But it that you're exactly right. Practically, it doesn't make sense. So, I I think that I think what what's laid out is sort of the um, best we can do, um, unless folks are willing to commit at the next board meeting that they're willing to stay until we're done. So we usually wrap up around nine, and usually the the members of the board lose energy around 745. <laughs> so um, I just don't know that expecting people to stay until midnight is productive. So I think, no. we're, on, I think we're on a good path. Um, I recognize the point you've made is very good that um, it would sure be nice to have had more time and more engagement with CDOT, but we're in the position we're in. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions on the schedule? All right, so we will continue our discussion at the next meeting. See you all then, and I hope everybody has a great couple of weeks. Until then, we're adjourned. Madam Chair, if I may, before you leave, um, so performance and engagement committee is meeting right after this meeting. Let's uh, let's start that at five forty-five. Great, and in that time between now and then, you can all fill out your collaboration assessment. Have a great night. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Be safe.